Castle County, Delaware. I'm your host, Melody Kitchen. You never know who we're going to talk to or where we're going to visit. For today's show, I'm pleased to welcome Don Volts, the Executive Director of the Delaware Sports Museum and Hall of Fame, and also known as Big Don Volts on WDEL. Thank you for being here today, Don. It's nice to be here. Now to begin with, can you tell us a little bit about your organization? I know that it is a combination between a Hall of Fame and a museum. Can you tell us a little bit about how it started and what it is? Well, it was a Hall of Fame first. Started okay. in 1976. Uh, the m main driving force behind it was a guy named Al Cartwright, who was the sports editor uh, of the News Journal. Uh, he started it and we had, I don't know, my math isn't good, but we had <laughs> Hall of Fame classes from 1976 up through 2001 without a museum. It was thought that we needed some kind of a physical presence for the Hall of Fame. Uh, as a result, in the 90s, um, there were a lot of plans, a lot of ideas, a lot of fundraisers, things like that going on to try to come up with a physical museum that would house the Delaware Sports Hall of Fame. Sure. Uh, when the Blue Rocks came to town in 1992, they had a building, uh, and all of a sudden, some places that were thought of earlier said, well, maybe not quite as good. Maybe we can latch on to Frawley Stadium. Sure. And so, in 2002, after a couple of years of fundraising, uh, in which about a million dollars or so was raised to build this, there is a museum that is attached down the right field line at Frawley Stadium. Uh, and as you come into the stadium, it, it, you go past it. Uh, a lot of people don't know it's there. I was going to ask. But as a result of that, in 2002, which is now 15 years ago, or 13 years ago, uh, we have a, a museum that goes with it. Um, but there's always been a little tension between, you know, are we first a museum, are we first a Hall of Fame? Uh, the Board of Directors, it's my understanding over the years, has seen it more as a Hall of Fame, and oh yes, we have a museum just to supplement it. So the museum's kind of had short shrift at times, but uh, we're trying to see if we can't change that. Uh, on the subject of location, as you mentioned, a lot of people might not know where it is or how to find it. Can you give us a little bit more detailed uh, description on how people might actually find it? Yeah, we don't have a big neon sign out that says, right. you know, eat at Joe's or anything like that. But we do have a small, there is a sign that's got our logo on it. Uh, as you're coming into Frawley Stadium, if you're heading down to the Chase Center, which okay. is on the left-hand side, and Frawley Stadium is on the right-hand side, we are actually a part of Frawley Stadium. It's been built into Frawley Stadium, so that's where we are right now. As you're coming in off of 95, you come down to the riverfront, and uh, like I said, uh, off to the left you'll have the Chase Center. Off to the right is Frawley Stadium. If you go around to the front of the stadium, you've passed us. There is a, a parking lot in the back. Sometimes people will park there, they'll walk to the front of the stadium to go in, and they have to walk right past our entrance. So okay. that's where we are. All right. And the annual gala induction is coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's on May 5th this year, uh, and we always have a large banquet in which usually about 10 inductees are brought into the Hall of Fame. We've already had the election for it. We've released the names of the people that are going to be inducted this year. We usually have three, four, five hundred people sometimes, as, as many as five hundred, four. And that are who coming would this consist the, of? Is this, who can attend the gala? Anyone can attend it. Okay. Anyone can attend it. Right. Um, the best way to find out how much it is, well, I will tell, say right now, it's sixty-five dollars <laughs> to attend. Okay. Uh, but it's a great evening. Uh, we usually have something. We, we usually have a silent auction uh, with sports uh, memorabilia and that sort of thing beforehand. Uh, we have it in the big ballroom at the Chase Center. It's at the Chase Center every year, which is right across the street from where we're located. Right. Um, anybody can come. Uh, the best way to find out about it is to go to our website which is desports.org you can actually um, buy your tickets online that's a new feature uh, with our revamped uh, website which is just uh, had that ability in the last four or five months um, it allows you to pick who you want to sit with for instance some people oh, okay. have some connection to one of the inductees sure and if they want to sit with other people who are there to honor that person in particular. Then you can mention that on our website and you can, you can get placed uh, with those people. You can pay it through PayPal, which is available on our website. Uh, but anyone is uh, invited to do it. It's a wonderful evening. Uh, there are a lot of the former 
or past inductees that will show up for it. Uh, so sometimes, every now and then, we have a little who's who of sports in the state of Delaware with some of the people that come out. We hope we have a large who's who, but it doesn't always work that way. Now, who would, who would make up the inductees? How, what are the requirements to be inducted? Well, that's one thing. I always have to bring my notes because it is an interesting, an interesting way it's phrased. In, in, in the bylaws of, of the uh, Delaware Sports Museum and Hall of Fame, it tells us what eligibility is. And this is sometimes kind of a, a little bit of a, a disagreement with even some of the people on the board. Sure. But the way it's written is, in order to qualify for election, the person must be judged to have brought lasting fame and recognition to Delaware. Okay, that makes sense. Through his or her contributions in athletics, or have been outstanding within the state's borders. Now, that's one part of it. A candidate must have had a clear connection with Delaware before or during his period of excellence with achievements that have had a direct benefit to the state of Delaware. He or she may be a, may be a Delaware native who has right. made significant contributions in sport in another geographical area, and any question of the eligibility is decided by, by the, the board. board. Um, but the one thing that you note there, he, that, that person does not have to be a Delaware native. Okay. Most of the people that are in the Hall of Fame are Delaware natives. But some of the more notables are not. Uh, they have had a career that was significant in Delaware and then may have gone outside. This will be in particular some of the professionals that, sure. that we have. Right. That that went to the University of Delaware, for instance, or Delaware State. We have, for instance, we have John Taylor, a wide receiver from Delaware State University. He's from South Jersey, but he played three years at Delaware State, won a Super Bowl with the 49ers, and he's in our Hall of Fame. So that's one, uh, he brought fame to Delaware in this way. Every right. time he was on TV, and they would go through the starting lineups on TV, and they would say, John Taylor, Delaware State University. So that was the recognition that the state would get out of John Taylor and some other people too. Ultimately, Rich Gannon will be in, uh, another former Delo University of Delaware player. Elena Deladon, she'll sure. be a first ballot Hall of Famer as soon as she's eligible. Now the eligibility, the other thing about the eligibility is this. You cannot be elected when you are participating in whatever's gonna get you in. In other words, okay. an athlete has to be retired from their sport for three years. So okay. let's say Elena plays until she's 30. When she's 33, 33, she could be elected into the Delaware Sports Hall of Fame. Sure. Unless you, and this is kind of a nod to people that are in the media or coaches or something like that, once you hit 60, if you're still coaching and you've coached for 30 years, you've had a spectacular career, once you hit 60, you can be nominated and be voted in. So there are a few stipulations, but for the most part it's three years after you've retired or once you reach the age of 60. Sure. Um, now, so as you've mentioned, these are not only professional athletes. These Correct. are also, you know, members um, of sports teams here in colleges and just to mention, you know, some high schools. We've lost a lot of um, prominent high schools in Delaware. Schools like Brown, De La War, uh, P.S. DuPont, uh, Gunning Bedford. Does the museum feature anything with their history? We have some things in the museum that in particular talk about that era when there was the Brown and, the, and De La War and, and there in the 40s and 50s. It's not specific to the schools, okay. but it, it does show a, um, a lot of athletes from that era on the walls of our museum. Um, we have discussed um, uh, on the board about possibly being a, a depository, repository, I guess is the right word for it, for materials for really a Delaware sports history with that kind of stuff from schools like that that exist no longer. What about, right. what happened to their sports records? That sort of thing. What we're finding is there's very little that's been written down on any of these schools. And then the second part of that is that we don't have the resources at the moment to do it. Someday we might, but right now it's hard for us to try to recreate a lot of that information that we would need. Unfortunately, some of that may never be recreated. And that is unfortunate. 
but regarding the, the things that the information that we do have, can you tell us who maybe some of the more famous athletes that have been inducted well, would consist of? We have some famous ones, and first off, it's not just athletes, but we do have coaches, we have administrators, we have media people, uh, a lot of different categories that are out there, but I did write a few of them down. Famous ones that people might know as opposed to the average. Now, mind you, we have more than 300 people in the Delaware Sports Hall of Fame. We've been electing anywhere between six and ten people probably every year since 1976. Okay. Um, maybe first and foremost, well probably the single most famous if you went outside this area would be Randy White who was a McCain High School uh, star football player, played at the University of Maryland, played for the Dallas Cowboys, was a Super Bowl MVP when the, on one of the years when the Cowboys won the Super Bowl. He was voted MVP, and he not only is in the Delaware Sports Hall of Fame, we think we're the most important of that, but he's also in the College Football Hall of Fame and in the Professional Football Hall of Fame. So he's got the trifecta uh, right there, and he may be the single most famous that we have. He was a McCain High School uh, star. Interestingly, I'm told he was not even All-State when he was in high school. Not first, was not first team all state, but he went on to be the greatest player that ever came out of Delaware. Dallas Green was a Conrad High School grad, University of Delaware pitcher, and he managed the Phillies to their first World Series championship in 1980. Still active with the Phillies. I believe Big D is somewhere around 80 years old right now, but, but he's very active. He still is a scout, and he, they ask him for a lot of his opinions on things, and Dallas Green is a very prominent one. Tubby Raymond, the Delaware, a uh, longtime Delaware head football coach. Tubby's in the College Football Hall of Fame. Tubby uh, is one of, I believe it's now 10 or 11 coaches, college football history with 300 wins or more. He's right on 300. He's one of the more famous uh, ones. Uh, we have some other Major League Baseball players. Delino DeShields uh, was from Seaford and he was a uh, runner-up in the Rookie of the Year and had a very good career. Father, son, Dave and Derek May. Derek was just inducted last year. Uh, they both, uh, Dave went to William Penn, Derek went to Newark, uh, and they uh, were both very successful professional players. Luke Pettigrew, New York Giants, very good football player. Hal Bodley, the uh, writer for USA Today. He was a USA Today sports editor uh, for a number of years and works now for Major League Baseball. The Carpenters, Bob and Ruley Carpenter, father, son, who owned the Phillies. Uh, they are from Greenville. They are Delaware people, married into the DuPont family. That's why they're Delaware people. Bob Carpenter owned the Phillies, passed it down to his son. Ruley owned the team when they won the World Series in 1980. Judy Johnson, who's in Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, he was in the Negro Leagues first. And Judy Johnson, for whom the uh, stadium, uh, Frawley Stadium, Judy Johnson Field, uh, he's in Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame, as is Vic Willis. Uh, and a number of people like that. We had a lot of people that played professional baseball, some not so famous. I think the most interesting is a guy named Dick Hawk. He pitched in the late 1880s, uh, 1880s, maybe 1890s. Only pitched a few years in the majors. Um, but he pitched the first no-hitter that was thrown when the distance from the pitcher's mound to home plate was 60 feet 6 inches. It used to be a different length. That's considered the modern era of baseball's pitching because it was from 60 feet 6 inches. Dick Hawk pitched the first no-hitter from that distance, the only no-hitter by a Delawarean. He subsequently had a, was on an accident with a horse, threw him off, he was injured, and died at the age of 33. Oh, wow. Uh, but Dick Hawk was, he's one of those people, he's probably like a little trivia question. He pitched the first no-hitter and he, he was a guy from Wilmington, Delaware. See, that's the kind of thing that people might not know. And I didn't know it. I know that. <laughs> well, I know that it, spring just began, and that tends to be your busy time. Is that correct? We, we get started kind of when the Blue Rocks do. Their season begins in early April, and we'll start up right when they do in that first, uh, that first full week of April is when we'll, we'll kick things off. And then we go to end of October. Okay. We go about six months out of the year, and I... I actually thought that wasn't very long until I was down in Lewis a couple of weeks back speaking at the Zwanendale Museum and the curator or person that runs it there said, well, when are you open? I said, oh, that's a lot. I said, 
didn't seem like a lot to Is me. <laughs> but small museums, you know, we have very selective hours, selective times. We generally are open noon to five, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, and again, beginning of Oct uh, April until the end of October. So yes, we're gearing up for opening it up. Now we do, we, we will accommodate groups uh, that call us up in the winter time over the, in the off season, say we got a group, can we come in? And we have a volunteer coordinator, Frank Shea, who turns no groups aside. Uh, he'll bring them in and be there to, um, uh, to give them the tour through there. So while this is our busy season um, for the walk-ins and that sort of thing, you can go through the museum in the off season if you give us a buzz. <laughs> what are some of the things that people can participate on this tour? Through well, the museum? we have um, a little interactive Judy Johnson exhibit where uh, we've got uh, it's all, almost like a diorama kind of thing, and Judy Johnson's in there talking to a little boy about his baseball career. Um, we have a a um, one that uh, a little musical thing for. Uh, Casey at the Bat, where the, somebody recites Casey at the Bat. Now you say, well, what's that in Delaware for? Well, it turns out that Casey, of the famous poem, they believe was a guy from Wilmington by the name of, I believe, it's, I believe his name was Dan Casey, and he was a Wilmingtonian. And so that's explained in our exhibit of Casey at the Bat. Uh, and we have a couple of other things. We've got a... a, a, a in a broadcaster's exhibit, uh, we have a, a, something that allows you to hear some of our play-by-play -play, uh, people that are in there. And another one that's got a, an old-time ra uh, radio that actually has a recording in it. That, but it's all, sounds like it's from the 1940s with boxing matches and that sort of thing. So we do have a few interactive things. Um, we also have computers in there that if you know uh, what inductee you want to learn about, you can call that individual up and read it there. Now, you don't have to do that anymore just by coming to our place, but used to. Used to be that we didn't have all of those bios on our website. But since right. we opened a, since we rebuilt the website uh, about eight months ago, now if you go to our website, you can find whatever induct you're looking for and see a picture and read a, read a biography, a short biography of each of those people. Sure. Now. Is it fair to say that education as, is as much of a part of this as just entertainment? Uh, I think so. I mean, if you, we're like a lot of museums where, and, and when I go to a museum, I take forever, well, because I want to read everything that's on the walls. Right. I mean, if you were to read all the information that's on the walls of our museum, you would learn more about Delaware sports than you ever thought was possible. Because we do have... Uh, while it, we have a lot of people in the Hall of Fame, it's not specifically set up just for the Hall of Fame, but you will find, for instance, as you start through, we, we, we have, have it laid out in decades and periods of time. And then you get to the second half and we have separate uh, sports that are featured. But as you're going through and you start out at that very early part in the early 1900s when baseball was getting going and there's, there's the picture of Dick Hawk on the wall and you'll read about him, about how he threw the first uh, first no hitter in Major League Baseball when they was 60 feet six inches and there's a little little uh, circular thing there that says he's a member of the Delaware Sports Hall of Fame class of such and such. So you'll actually see an awful lot of those people on our walls but you'll also see other things about a particular team there maybe there's a photo of that it will tell you why that team is on there. Uh, there's a lot of educational value of going through there we have a lot of uh, memorabilia. Uh, one of our uh, one of our inductees is Frank Maisley, who was a loser, riding a you know oh, the luge no, okay. in the yep. uh, and <laughs> in 1984, uh, Frank carried the U.S. flag in the 84 Olympics at the head of the uh, U.S. delegation when they paraded in. They chose our Delaware luge member in there. His luge is up on the. Uh, hanging from the ceiling, so you can see what a luge looks like. I don't know what a luge looks like. So there's like, a, a many different sports that are in the museum. We're exactly. not just talking no. baseball, football. That, that's exactly that's a good point. We have some sports in there. For instance, somebody this year was elected in, out of the veterans. We do veterans group and contemporary veteran who was a trap shooter in the early part of the 20th century. Now, 
trap shooting's not really a sport anymore, but it was then. And this gentleman was one of the top trap shooters around, and he was just so you know trap shooting. We had Olympics, uh, Olympic different Olympic sports. Um, we even have a special Olympian who is in our Hall of Fame. We're the first sports Hall of Fame in America to take note of Special Olympics. We have a section for Special Olympics, and we have one of their members was elected into the Delaware Sports Hall of Fame about a dozen years ago or so. And so we, because it's such a big thing in Delaware, we thought that was an important thing to do. Absolutely. That to me seems like the kind of thing that people would want to know. Mm -hmm. Now, people that might have a, a great interest in the museum might want to volunteer. Can you tell us how they would go about volunteering? Do you still need volunteers? We need volunteers all the time. And uh, my good friend Frank Shea would be happy to entertain any people that would uh, like to contact us. And if you go to our website at desports.org, we do have a section where you click on it says volunteers. And if you want to volunteer, that allows you, tells you how to get in touch with us uh, to offer your services as a volunteer. We have a lot of different things you can do. Uh, we have been doing things such as trying to uh, get as much of the information that we have down in computerized form. So hey, maybe if you're good at that sort of thing, sure. uh, we have that kind of stuff, inventorying various things that we have, uh, uh, working with the, um, um, the banquet, trying to get that organized. That's a huge thing for us every year. Uh, there's just a lot of things that, that can be done and, you know, you may have something that you know how to do and we not, may not be thinking of that in terms of volunteers and, and someone might suggest that we say we can use you for this. So if you, uh, the best way is to go to our website again at desports.org and there is a place uh, on the banner that says uh, volunteer and that gets you right in touch with us. Well, that's just about do it for today. Is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Well, I just think, uh, you know, everybody has talked about, uh, a lot of people, are, uh, places are talked about as the best kept secret, but I think sometimes Delaware Sports Museum and Hall of Fame is uh, one of the best kept secrets, certainly around. People say, I didn't know you were there. Well, we've only been there for 13 years. <laughs> right. Um, and it's possible, there is a, there's been talk, there's a possibility we might actually be moving our location but there's nothing imminent. We're going to be where we are at Fraldy Stadium for, uh, for some time. Uh, and I, every person that goes through says, this is a wonderful little museum. We're not big. It doesn't take you forever to go through. Ha 45 minutes to an hour gets you to see about everything you want to see in there. But again, we do not charge a fee. We do request that if you go through and like what you saw, give us a little donation. That would be wonderful. Uh, if you come as part of a group, we do charge a small fee for that, but it's not very much. So I really think that uh, it's, if you want to learn about sports in the state of Delaware, and we do have a great sports history, uh, number one, go to our website at desports.org and come visit us uh, on the, down the right field line at Fraldy Stadium. I don't think you'll uh, regret one minute of it. Well, thank you so much for coming in today, Don, and congratulations on all your hard work and good luck with everything this spring. Thank you. We hope to have a very successful banquet. Well, that wraps up this edition of Spotlight on Newcastle County. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Please keep it tuned to NCC-TV, your premier source for local news and content in Northern Delaware. For executive producer Jim McDonald, director of communications Tony Prado, and the NCC-TV crew Lisa Lancaster and Nash Chelapu, this is Melody Kitchen. Thank you for watching and take care.